Jeremiah chapter 21. Father, we ask that you would sanctify us by your truth. Your word is truth. In Jesus' name, amen. Jeremiah 21 verse 1 reads, The word which came to Jeremiah from the Lord when King Zedekiah sent to him Pasher, the son of Melchiah, and Zephaniah, the son of Messiah, the priest, saying. Now, this is not the Pasher who was mentioned in the previous chapter. This is another messenger from the king to Jeremiah. Here we go. Verse 2, please inquire of the Lord for us, for Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, makes war against us. Perhaps the Lord will deal with us according to all his wonderful works, that the king may go away from us. All of a sudden, the people are thinking about God now that the enemy is at the gate. Earlier, the wise guys were saying, come on, God. Judge us. Let's see what you got. Now it's, uh, do you think maybe God will protect us? I don't know. What do you think? Verse 3, then Jeremiah said to them, Thus you shall say to Zedekiah. Now remember, Zedekiah is the king. Thus says the Lord God of Israel, Behold, I will turn back the weapons of war that are in your hands, with which you fight against the king of Babylon and the Chaldeans who besiege you outside the walls, and I will assemble them in the midst of this city. Will God help us? No, not quite. God says he will make your weapons useless. Verse 5, I myself will fight against you, God says to his people. I myself will fight against you with an outstretched hand and with a strong arm, even in anger and fury and great wrath. God is not in the mood to help his unrepenting people, nor is he in the mood to show them any mercy. The answer is no, no, and no. We're not going to help you. God says, I'm not going to help you. Verse 6, I will strike the inhabitants of this city, both man and beast. They shall die of great pestilence. Punishment will come in several stages. Disease will be one form of that punishment. Notice verse 7. And afterward, says the Lord, I will deliver Zedekiah, king of Judah, his servants and the people, and such as are left in this city from the pestilence and the sword and the famine into the hand of Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, into the hand of their enemies and into the hand of those who seek their life. And he shall strike them with the edge of the sword he shall not spare them, or have pity or mercy. So, what God is saying is that whoever the disease and the famine doesn't kill, the king of Babylon will kill. Verse 8, Now you shall say to this people, Thus says the Lord, Behold, I set before you the way of life and the way of death. See, what happens to God's people is their choice. Totally up to them. God is giving them the grace to choose. Verse 9, He who remains in this city shall die by the sword, by famine, and by pestilence. But he who goes out and defects to the Chaldeans who besiege you, he shall live, and his life shall be a surprise to him. Babylon is God's rod of punishment. So those who try to fight them will die for sure. Those who surrender will at least escape with their life. Better than nothing. Verse 10, God says, For I have set my face against this city for adversity and not for good, says the Lord. It shall be given into the hand of the king of Babylon, and he shall burn it with fire. God is completely determined to punish his people. Verse 11, And concerning the house of the king of Judah, say, Hear the word of the Lord. 
O house of David, and that would be the king of Judah, the southern section of the land. Thus says the Lord, execute judgment in the morning and deliver him who is plundered out of the hand of the oppressor, lest my fury go out like fire and burn so that no one can quench it because of the evil of your doings. Their sin and their lack of compassion was a direct challenge to God's holiness. And it was a dare to his sense of justice. Verse 13, Behold, I'm against you, O inhabitant of the valley and rock of the plain, says the Lord, who say, Who shall come down against us? Or who shall enter our habitations? The people of Jerusalem thought, we are safe. No army can prevail against us. They overlooked the fact that God is bigger than any army. And God was no longer on their side because they were no longer on his side. Verse 14, But I will punish you according to the fruit of your doings, says the Lord. I will kindle a fire in its forest, and it shall devour all things around it. God's mercy is on those who repent. God's mercy is God not giving sinners what their actions deserve. God's justice is God giving us what we do deserve. He is just toward unrepenting sinners. That's very bad news. He is not merciful towards unrepenting sinners. He is just toward them, which means trouble. Chapter 22, thus says the Lord, Go down to the house of of the king of Judah, and there speak this word. Now, the temple where Jeremiah was preaching was higher than the palace of the king, and that's why he's told to go down to the king's palace. Verse 2, And say, Hear the word of the Lord, O king of Judah, you who sit on the throne of David, you and your servants and your people who enter these gates. The gates are the gates of the king's palace. Verse 3, Thus says the Lord, execute judgment and righteousness and deliver the plundered out of the hand of the oppressor. Do no wrong and do no violence to the stranger, the fatherless, or the widow, nor shed innocent blood in this place. King Jehoiakim angered God. He made slave labor out of God's people. He forced them to build him himself a, a gorgeous palace and didn't pay them for their work. That's the sort of thing that God hates, by the way. Unfair labor practices are a sinful thing in the eyes of God. It's, it's, a, it's a manifestation of greed, whatever you want to call it. The laborer is worthy of their pay. And God hates this sort of thing. Verse 4, For if you indeed do this thing, then shall enter the gate, gates of this house, riding on horses and chariots, accompanied by servants and people, kings who sit on the throne of David. God promises, in other words, good things if the government stops doing bad and starts doing good. 5. But if you will not hear these words, I swear by myself, says the Lord, that this house shall become a desolation. If they don't repent, God swears he's going to punish and if he doesn't do it, he will cease to exist. He will do it because he cannot lie. And he cannot cease to exist. Verse 6. For thus says the Lord to the house of the king of Judah, You are Gilead to me, the head of Lebanon, yet I surely will make you a wilderness and cities which are not inhabited. God will make their pretty palace very ugly. If they don't repent. 7. I will prepare destroyers against you. Every one with his weapons. They shall cut down your choice cedars. And cast them into the fire. God will call and equip people to be his destroyers. To use against his people. Verse 8. And many nations will pass by this city. And everyone will say to his neighbor. Why has the Lord done so to this great city? So even those who didn't know God will know that God's wrath, 
They will recognize God's wrath when they see it. God will defend his holiness to the world by punishing his sinful people, sending the message to everyone, I'm holy. No one gets away with sin, not even my people. The destruction of Jerusalem, the slaughter of God's people, God's people being taken cap into captivity by Babylon, all those things will be God's way of announcing to the world, I hate sin. And this is what I do to those who do not repent. The Bible says judgment begins in the household of God. It doesn't stop there, but that's where it begins. Verse 9, then they will answer, because they have forsaken the covenant of the Lord their God and worshipped other gods and served them. See, the world will get the point. When you rebel against God, sooner or later he will punish And who knows, perhaps the punishment of God's people will result in the salvation of the heathen when they see it. Maybe they'll get scared. 10. Weep not for the dead, nor bemoan him, but weep bitterly for him who goes away. For he shall return no more, nor see his native country. For thus says the Lord concerning Shalom the son of Josiah, king of Judah, who reigned instead of Josiah, his father, who went from this place. He shall not return here anymore. In other words, don't weep for dead saints. If you're going to weep, then weep for living sinners because they're the ones who are going to be miserable. 12. But he shall die in the place where they have led him captive, and he shall see this land no more. Woe to him who builds his house by unrighteousness and his chambers by injustice, who uses his neighbor's service without wages and gives him nothing for his work. All dishonesty and unfair labor practices are seen by God, and it all makes him very angry. Verse 4, who says, I will build myself a wide house with spacious chambers and cut out windows for it, paneling it with cedar and painting it with vermilion. The person who prospers through oppression and fraud may get what they want for a while, but they will pay for what they would not pay for in one way or another. God will collect. Verse 15, Shall you reign because you enclose yourself in cedar? Did not your fathers eat and drink and do justice and righteousness? Then it was well with him. If the goal is to be happy and content, then God says, you ought to do things my way. Otherwise, happiness is always going to elude you every single time. 16, he judged, talking about the king's father. He judged the cause of the poor and needy. Then it was well. Was not this knowing me, says the Lord? See, when, when Jesus will say, depart from me, I never knew you on judgment day, it will be for the reason which is also stated right here. If a person doesn't care for those who need care and treat people when they are not treating God well, I should, see, I should say, if a person doesn't care for those who need care and treat people well, then they're not treating God well, which means they don't know him, which means they're in trouble on Judgment Day, 17. Yet your eyes and your heart are for nothing, but your covetousness for shedding innocent blood, and practicing oppression and violence. And then he says in verse 18, Therefore thus says the Lord concerning Jehoiakim, the son of Josiah, king of Judah, they shall not lament for him, saying, Alas, my brother, or alas, my sister. They shall not lament for him, saying, Alas, master, or alas, his glory. No one will cry for the king. 
because everyone will be too busy crying over themselves. Verse 19. He shall be buried with the burial of a donkey, dragged and cast out beyond the gates of Jerusalem. God will see that the unrighteous king is disgraced in death and after death. He won't be buried, just thrown far enough away so that no one will have to smell the stench of his rotting flesh. That's what he's saying. Verse 20, go up to Lebanon and cry out, and lift up your voice in Bashan, cry from Abarim, for all your lovers are destroyed. In other words, all these countries, all those countries Israel counted on for protection instead of counting on God will not be around to help them. 21. I spoke to you in your prosperity, but you said, I will not hear. This has been your manner from your youth, that you did not obey my voice. The wind shall eat up all your rulers, and your lovers shall go into captivity. Surely then you will be ashamed and humiliated for all your wickedness. Their help will blow away like the wind. They should have obeyed God and trusted him. They would have been better off. 23, O oh, inhabitant of Lebanon, making your nest in the cedars, how gracious will you be when pangs come upon you, like the pain of a woman in labor. Lebanon lived in comfort and thought they always would be feeling comfortable. But comfort will be a distant memory after they uh, are punished like God's people. Verse 24, As I live, says the Lord, though Coniah, the son of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, were the signet on my right hand, yet I would pluck you off. And I will give you into the hand of those who seek your life and into the hand of those whose face you fear, the hand of Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, and the hand of the Chaldeans. So I will cast you out and your mother who bore you into another country where you were, were not born, and there you shall die. But to the land to which they desired to return, they shall not return. This Koniah, or Jehoiachin, actually is another name for him, thought he had it made as king of Judah. He really did. He, he thought, I can sin with no fear of punishment because I'm from the line of King David. God is saying, Mister, you better think again. Verse 28, is this Koniah a despised broken idol? Is he a vessel? in which is no pleasure? Why are they cast out, he and his descendants, and cast into a land which they do not know? O earth, 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 hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord, write this man down as childless, a man who shall not prosper in his days, for none of his descendants shall prosper, sitting on the throne of David and ruling any more in Judah. And it's not that Kaniah wouldn't have any children. It's that none of his children would succeed him as king. Next time, chapter 23.